dear presence, did you like the session? Now it will be followed by question and answer. Uh, we'll ask questions to our Prabhu. Uh, there are wireless available. Okay. We already got a question. And there are some written questions as well. Can we have the questions please? Hare Krishna, thank you very much Prabhu for your wonderful presentation. This evening is really very fruitful to me. The way you define and explain spirituality as well as the see the total meaning of spirituality, intelligence and purifications, that's really meaningful to me. And I, I do believe this all of us here realized the intensity of the impact of spirituality and really the way you explain is a very thought-provoking lecture no doubt and it helped us to realize the way we should understand the God the way we mean the God the impact of God and role of God in our life but you know this with the general people we do the general people are getting very confused sometimes you know this the way you say the spirituality the philosophy and practice and we are nowadays in the era of globalization and mass media we are encountered by a lot of philosophies and this philosophy is misguiding us or guiding us in a different way the way you say it, what really matters in life that means that brings happiness in our life so different philosophies are saying what really matters to bring happiness in your life so if we are living in the era of globalization when we are facing lot of philosophies some philosophy says happiness lies in sacrifice some philosophy says happiness lies in consumptions when we see the other peoples are growing developing like in developing world the governments are focusing on work hard to grow in terms of material in terms of material material science if you if you work hard if you gain money you will bring happiness for you and your family on the other hand when we make the alignment with the what we feel matters and we really feel matters that's if we follow a particular religious philosophy a particular religious philosophy for example Bhagavad Gita the way it's explained us to live our life that says right what really matters but when we are guided by the economics society the way our society leading us we compare with other selves like Americans have that we must have that otherwise we cannot get that happiness we love to go to USA for making money to send it back to country to make the people happy in our society so under such circumstances I'm really uh, asking you like the way you started with the philosophy psychology and the science of explaining the yes. spirituality and the so life let, let me summarize the question and yeah. then you, uh, so you want to complete it okay, like, no, I, I, I'm I'm just, got yeah, the question. yeah you just continue please with that the, yeah, I'm so, also confused with that thank you very much yeah so broadly I got three points in your question first is that there are so many different can have a seat please there are so many different philosophies in the world and especially in the western world we see there is so much progress and they're not necessarily spiritual they're ma they focus on material progress and we also feel that when there's very material progress then without that we cannot be happy so how does a person find their way through all this confusion one thing about Bhagavad Gita is that the Bhagavad Gita is in no way against material progress 
it is against material progress becoming the sole definition of progress that we are while we are spiritual beings we are also in physical bodies and physical bodies need a certain level of uh, uh, requirements and conveniences for functioning and there is absolutely nothing wrong in acquiring that the gita says yukta har viharasya that our body needs to need to be taken care of in an ap appropriate adequate way so if we consider progress progress definitely within that material progress has a part to it when arjuna went to his gurukul he studied archery and by that study he became better and better in archery so he progressed materially in terms of his archery expertise so uh, the material world works according to certain principles so if we look at the western world in the last 10 years i have spent almost uh, more than half of the year in the western world uh, speaking and talking and uh, sharing spirituality over there and two things first i noticed is that the level of material thought and organization that is there in the western world is far far more than what in the eastern say the indian subcontinent which is where i have lived and grown so in general we humans wherever we invest our energy there we will progress so humanity especially in the western world has invested its energy in the material domain and it has progressed phenomenally and that rather than denying or downplaying or deriding that we just acknowledge that humans have the capacity to make a change so material when energy is invested in the material domain we will progress in the material domain at the same time the second thing that has struck me is there are so many mental health problems and in fact to the extent indians or asians they go to the west and they become prosperous to that extent their mental health problems also increase the same same people asians who are in india whether it's indians chinese bangladeshi whoever they as long as they are here they even do not seem to have that many mental health problems but they go there it becomes more so the problem is that material progress does not lead to all round progress and that is why the western world is more and more becoming open to eastern spirituality there is a book written by philip goldberg the uh, called the american veda so i met him also when i was in america and he's talking about how into the heartland of america eastern spiritual practices especially indian spiritual practices be they yoga be they mantra chanting be they now kirtan is like a music category in itself and people pay a fortune to just be to attend musical concert concerts so why is all this spirituality being explored yoga is so huge in the western world almost one in every fourth person in the west has done some course in yoga how much they practice is secondary but almost one in 10 or 115 people do practice something also so why because again the point is material progress alone does not lead to happiness so we can go to both extremes you know material progress is everything that's the western conception hmm? and that is clearly false but then the other side you can go and say material progress is nothing now this is a distortion of spiritual teaching of the bhagavad gita what the gita says is that if we want human progress hmm? so in human progress material progress can be one aspect of it but along with that we humans along the physical side we have a mental side then we have a spiritual side so all three need to progress if all three are progressing then that's when we our progress will be holistic and sustainable so the gita offers us a holistic world view that's why i said spirituality i didn't say spirituality is the study of the spiritual 
it is the study of what matters so material progress matters physical conveniences and comforts matter but our inner state of mind matters and our spiritual well being matters so a philosophy there can be many philosophies in the world but a philosophy that integrates various aspects of reality and places them in a hierarchy and harmony that is what i have found in the bhagavad gita okay thank you any other questions or comments yes proj we got some questions written here uh dear audience if you want to share your questions uh there are sheets available with our uh, prabhus our volunteers please collect from the prabhus proj uh, may i read the question to you it's about reincarnation as far as we know the concept about rebirth is this is discussed only in hindu religion why other religion did not discuss about rebirth reincarnation please discuss briefly about reincarnation which is confers confusing to many of us confusing confusing to many of us okay so firstly i am not sure whether reincarnation discussed only in hinduism it's definitely discussed in buddhism it's discussed in jainism and even in christianity there are clearly references to that when a baby is born blind when a child is born blind jesus asks that uh, he asks his followers why was this child born blind is it because of the parents misdeeds or the baby's misdeeds now unless there is some understanding that the baby existed before uh, what, what misdeed could the baby have done did the baby just fold its legs wrong inside the womb and that's why it was born blind that's absurd so there are references now the concept of reincarnation if is explained elaborately in the vedic tradition because the vedic tradition centers on sages who have dedicated their life to spiritual growth with all due respects the bible if you consider the old testament is basically the story of the chosen people who the followers from egypt who, have, who later became jews and their adventures and the prophet there is no very serious philosophical discussion about the nature of reality it is a book of miraculous interventions of god in his chosen people lives and in new testament the the bible is again basically a book about primarily the gospels which are jesus life story and then the epistles of paul which are basically his instructions to how you can live a life faithful to jesus jesus teachings so there is not much serious philosophical discussion so there are christian philosophers who have said that alistair uh, macgregor is one who said that the idea of reincarnation is completely compatible with christianity i have written a book called demystifying reincarnation where i talk about re- how reincarnation has acceptance in all the theist all the major traditions of the world across history and geography now basically what is the idea of reincarnation it is that say we are spiritual beings so inside us this is the body and within that is the soul so at death basically the body falls but then the soul comes out and then the soul goes through a journey and then it enters into a new body so the soul entering into a new body is called reincarnation to come incarnate to come in flesh to come again in flesh is reincarnation now if the soul does not get a body soon for whatever reason then the soul exists in a disembodied state and that is what is called as a ghost but that's a different subject now there are many cases of children who remember their past lives uh, dr ian stevenson was a pioneer in the study of this and there are john trucker and many others who have studied after that so they have noted that peep two people who lived at completely different places at different times the second person remembers specific details of the person's previous life so that is in reincarnation studies or past life memory studies they have found four levels of evidences first is recollections 
that a child recollects specific details in my book on the incarnation i talk about how there's a case of the one boy titu sharma he is living in lucknow and he says my name is suraj suresh sharma and i live in kanpur and i own an electrical shop and then when he goes there then the next stage is recognitions when so titu is a small just 5 year old boy he is taken by his parents to kanpur and he's never been there before but he tells the tonga where should we go and then he goes there there is actually a studio by the name varma electrical studio and there is a woman who is and he says she is my wife now she is much older than him but he recognizes her by name and then her children the children are older than this boy but he goes to them and fondles their hair as if like a father fondling the hair of children ruffling the hair and then not only recognitions there are behaviors behaviors means the person behaves not like the person from this life but from the person from the previous life so there are many cases of say people behaving in completely different from their birth family and behaving as if from their previous family this could be in terms of food preferences this could be in terms of behavioral uh, this specific likes and dislikes and then most strongly there are birth marks so the suresh varma had been killed point blank in a attack so a bullet had entered into his head from one side one temple and come out from the other side so t2 had birth marks exactly at the same place in his body where the bullet marks had entered and departed so police investigation had been done because suresh varma had been murdered and the post mortem reports of suresh varma when they compared where exactly was the entry wound and the exit wound they found it exactly at the same locations but t2 had birth marks so these are all four converging lines of evidence which point to the reality of reincarnation thank you um, we have got so much uh, so uh, so many questions uh, the next question is how this concept of science and spirituality have the youth generations of sanatani especially our sanatani girls are converting at an alarming rate so converting to other religion at an you, alarming rate <coughs> i didn't get the question last part okay. of the question how this concept of science and spirituality help the youth generation generations of sanatani especially our sanatani girls as they are converting at an alarming rate converting to what to other religion well from a practical perspective there is a religious marketplace in the world and whoever markets their religion better people will be attracted to that so what happened in the broad vedic tradition is that when there were kings who were ruling the kings would be patrons for the spiritual teachers for the religious priests so now the priestly infrastructure is still there in terms of we have temples and priests but the educational infrastructure in terms of sharing spiritual wisdom sharing the philosophy has been lost so if there is no one sharing the spiritual wisdom of our tradition people will be attracted to wisdom of other traditions and worse still if our tradition is presented simply as a set of rules which don't make sense then people will adopt something else which uh, seems to make more sense or seems to offer some social advantages so it is if we just have take a scientific approach to this scientific means we look at the practical factors that are there i'd say that things are changing that what you are saying is true but there are lots of people especially when i go to america uk i find a lot of young people are also turning towards spirituality and especially indian spirituality you know at their homes their parents may tell them to chant some mantra they will not chant but when they go to college and the college there is a mantra meditation club and there they learn about mantra chanting and they feel hey this is cool i want to do this so basically we need more and more educational initiatives okay okay uh, if i don't believe in god can i be a spiritual person 
according to the philosophy of sip if i don't believe in god of can i be a spiritual person of... according to the philosophy you provided sip sip okay okay so now many times when people say i don't believe in god what they have the idea is that the, everyone has a particular conception of god and we are reacting to that conception of god i was in america and one boy told me that i don't believe in god i was giving a college talk and then he said okay so what is the what is the conception of god you don't believe in he said no i don't believe in any god okay that's true but tell me what is the conception he said i don't believe in a god who sends you to hell who sends people to hell just because they don't believe in him so i said even i don't believe in such a god the gita doesn't say such a conception of god the gita says hell is for wrong doers not non believers people can believe what they want god gives us freedom to believe but if we act in harmful and destructive ways then that is what we are held accountable for so basically many people who say i don't believe in god if we just explore what is their conception of god that they are rejecting then it is a conception of god which is quite distinct from the conception of the divine given in the bhagavad gita so to be spiritual means to be seeking something beyond the material to at least be valuing it substantially and when we value something beyond the material then gradually we become more open to exploring what that non material thing is and then we may compare our conception of god with what is taught in the tradition what is taught in scriptures and we can come to a greater understanding so i would say that the key characteristic of being spiritual is giving due importance to something beyond the material how can we remain mentally undisturbed by provoking situations to remain undisturbed in provoking situations you know the more things change the more we need to hold on to the things that don't change so first of all we need to have something that does not change and then we need to be able to hold on to that thing so for example somebody whom we care for that person behaves in a very disturbing way say so we give a lot of importance to money our self worth is equal to our net worth and then as the stock market crashes then we will be disturbed so the key to not being disturbed is to be able to connect with the things that don't change so spiritual practices like mantra chanting like praying these connect us with a divine reality who does not change so basically i give the example of anchor we are all in this ocean but the divine earlier i depicted as the anchor but actually divine is the anchor who extends throughout the ocean and wherever we are from there we can just catch hold of the anchor and to the extent we hold on to the anchor to that extent we will become will develop samatva will become steady amidst duality okay uh, thanks for your nice lecture to be spiritual there are so many rules and regulations to maintain how can we apply them in today's busy life see the point of spirituality is not rules the point of spirituality is a relationship and relationship is developed by focusing on the personal connection when we want to relate with a particular person naturally we'll try to understand what their likes are what their dislikes are and we'll align ourselves accordingly so spirituality is about coming to harmony with ultimate reality so rules if you are only focusing on the rules then they can seem restrictive but all rules have a purpose like if you consider cricket as a sports cricket has so many rules you know the bowler has to bowl but should not go beyond this line the batsman has to bat but the batsman has to no hit the ball only when it is in this domain after the batsman has hit the ball and the ball has gone into the sky and the fielder is coming to catch the ball at that time the baller cannot go and hit the ball or the baller cannot go and hit this fielder you cannot do that there are rules but what happens is within those rules the baller the batsman the fielder 
they can all develop their skills and they can all excel so rules are for the per rules are not ends in themselves rules are for developing excellence and playing the sport similarly in spirituality the rules are meant for us to help develop the relationship to come in greater harmony as i said to appreciate our gifts through inner connection and then to contribute in a mood of service using those gifts okay. this world is so competitive nowadays is so com com competitive complicated okay. competitive competitive yeah okay obviously our sanatani culture and belief are much enriched and wholesome than any other religious belief but our spiritual thoughts are not being able to combat the aggressive attitude of other religion and our youths are easily being converted uh, is it not our spiritual and modest ideology lagging as behind is it not our spiritual and modest modest ideology modest. lagging us behind modest or moral modest modest Ide ideology okay. well in as i said conversion is is a challenge but we have to consider what is the cause of it see no other tradition in the world has been as attacked both geopolitically and intellectually as has been the vedic tradition no in the indian subcontinent the vedic tradition was there for a long time but the indian subcontinent is you could say geo geopolitically extremely vulnerable like i was in america for 3 months america is uniquely geopolitically blessed in the history of the world no that means you know, there no enemies canada is not a hostile country mexico is not a very powerful country and surrounded by oceans is protected the indian subcontinent is vulnerable from above although there are himalayas still there are passages to the himalayas that people can attack and from below also there are other land masses people can come by ships so no other tradition has been as attacked as the indian tradition and the fact that it has survived in spite of that that itself is re remarkable and no other tradition from classical or prehistorical times if you go to egypt today there's nothing of the pharaohs and the egyptian civilization there if you go to greece there's nothing of the greek civilization even modern china is very very different from ancient china there's hardly anything of uh, chinese civilization so the, the indian civilization has remarkable resilience and that needs that comes from its intrinsic spiritual strength so we need to tap that strength and share that so swami prabhupad us picture we have over here he was 70 years old when he decided that i want to share the spiritual wisdom with the world at the age of 70 he left india and single handedly he went to america which is 40 rupees and within 10 years just by his vigor to share spiritual wisdom and by his faith in the value of what he was sharing he built over 108 temples he wrote over 70 books he went on a global tour circumnavigating the world 14 times he inspired millions of people so there is a lot of spiritual spiritual potency which is available right now so rather than worrying too much about what other religions are doing and how they are converting we need to focus more on understanding what is the actual teaching of our tradition and aligning our life according to it the more we do that the more people will be attracted to it we have some questions there prabhu i am basically a pediatrician that is a physician pertaining to the child care so my conflict is while i teach my students about the early childhood development hmm. that means we believe that child are born with their genetic potential as dictated by the nature again that will be uh, translated into action with the environment he is being uh, uh, nurtured yeah. so that is called there is a nature nurture, nurture debate, yeah. interaction 
So in that case, if I am born in a prostitution, I would not have been a doctor. It, it is assumed that. So what is the problem uh, and how do you really correlate these things whether I was uh, born earlier, had a lot of mistakes to come to this world as a uh, uh, individual, as an individual from prostitution. And that is one. So you're using the word prostitution? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean that okay, so it is the environment. Born, somebody born just, in that kind of environment. Okay, just, I got it, just yeah. to say I, no, how I, we are being no, born. I, I didn't hear the word clearly. Go ahead. I, I, so basically the nature nurture is a very important subject and it is true that people are shaped by both. Now what you are saying is true that if somebody is born in a bad neighborhood, no, it's very likely that their life is going to go on a dark pathway. But it is not always like that. Some of the most inspiring stories in human history are of people who were born in terrible circumstances and those who rose above those adversities. So while nurture does play a significant role, nurture is alone is not necessarily destiny. Nurture alone does not determine our future. It definitely determines our future, but not alone. Similarly, nature alone, it does not determine our future. We all have a particular nature, but we can discipline our nature. Some kid might be born with a very aggressive nature. Short-tempered, fighting, aggressive. But the child hangs out with or is brought up by people who are moderately behaved, who are restrained. That will rub off. Maybe not entire character will change, but nature can be, I said, it can be disciplined. It cannot be completely changed, but it can be disciplined for strength. And so people who are aggressive, if they also have a certain level of discipline, then that aggression can help them to become protectors instead of just attackers and disruptors. So now, what the Gita says is that each one of us has some karmic baggage that we carry from our previous life. So this, if this is birth and this is death. Now, we have existed before this. We had a death and we had a birth. And we'll have another birth and then another death. So like this, there is multi-life progression. And what you talk about the genetic potential. That in one sense from our previous lives, we get a certain level of daiva or destiny. The same idea is talked about in different traditions by different names. It's called as kishmet in the Arabic tradition, kismet. It's called as Shibole or something like that in Japanese, many things are there. So now what the Vedic tradition says is that a major installation of destiny, of past karma comes to us at birth. That birth means that as you said, the kind of genes that we have, the kind of complexion that we have, the kind of IQ level that we have. Now IQ level can definitely be improved. But it's very difficult for somebody if they have a starting level of 70 to go to 140. From 120 somebody can go to 140, 150, something like that. But there is a starting point. And then similarly, by our karma, by the destiny that is the basically the resulting from our karma from previous lives, there are certain events in our life that are fixed. So the kind of environment in which we'll grow up that to some extent is fixed. So that's where the nurture aspect comes in. But within that environment, whom do we focus on? So beyond both of nature and nurture, there is free will. Now destiny may determine the complexion of our face. Some people may have dark complexion, some people may have fair complexion, some people may have in between, whatever. Somebody may have blonde hair, somebody may have black hair. So destiny determines our complexion, but we determine the expression on our face. 
and even a face which does not have a very attractive complexion if the person is cheerful they look attractive now destiny may determine again the broad kind of people in which we grow up but within that community whom do we focus on whom do we spend more time with that's up to us somebody may have very loving parents but they may have a bitter cousin or a bitter uncle and they spend more time with that person or they take more from that person and they become bitter or somebody may have very neglectful parents but they may have a caring grandmother and they may take more from their grandmother so within nurture it is that there are different people who are nurturing in different ways and the individual has free will whom they focus on and conversely even the caregivers those who are giving nurture also they they also have free will and sometimes the parents may just complain about life you know my life is so unfortunate this person did this to me and that person did that to me and that person did that to me and that that influence will go on to the children but the parents make the best of what they have the children will get that so basically we all have so the nature and the nurture situations of that both of them are determined by our destiny which is determined by our past karma which is determined by our use of free will and we also have free will right now the margin of free will may be small or big depending on the situation but we always have some free will and to the extent we use it well we will find that we can create a brighter future for ourselves and our free will it can be boosted it can be strengthened by divine will so if we practice bhakti if we connect with god and whatever free will we have it becomes much stronger and that's how we can transcend or rise above our situations okay thank you, uh, thank you for the explanation though i feel it is completely based on faith rather than scientifically proven mechanism anyway okay, okay now let me complete address this point see there is faith required even in science because science you can say it operates based on evidence but we have not studied all of humanity we are, we study a particular sample and based on that we project we infer we induct we use the method of induction so whether our future induction will be true or not that is an article of faith so faith is required even in science when we took the vaccines some testing was done but that does not mean that in the future those vaccines will not have some other counterproductive effects so faith is required even in science now it is is faith required in spirituality of course but it is not completely faith it is faith coupled with in science you may have physical evidence in terms of case studies in in spirituality there is reason and logic so basically we notice that there are different starting points for people now why are there different starting points we could basically have three explanations one is that uh, just life is a game of chance and some people are lucky and some people are unlucky well okay that is a possibility but that is not the way we function within this life no parent tells their children you know whether you wash your teeth or you don't wash your teeth you know still your teeth are going to get destroyed no parent teaches their children that whether you make your bed or don't make your bed you know life is going to be the same no we operate based on an implicit acceptance of cause effect so if during life we operate based on cause effect then why at the start of life there should be no cause effect there should be only chance blind chance so basically the starting conditions of life we can explain them in one way is chance but that is inconsistent with how we function in life hmm? now the other explanation could be divine will or more precisely divine caprice god's arbitrary will 
God has decided this person should be like this, this person should be like that. But then, why does God discriminate like this? And if God discriminates arbitrarily by getting some children to be born in wealthy families and some in poor families, then why should we even such a worship, worship such a discriminatory God? How can we love and trust a being who is so discriminatory? So this basically alienates us from God. And in fact, when the choice is between chance and arbitrary divine will, many thoughtful people will choose chance and become atheistic. But that is one of the main reasons, well, not but, that is one of the main reasons why atheism is growing in the Western world. Because as people become more thoughtful, the dogmas of the kind of religion which says that everything is determined by God's arbitrary will, that is utterly alienating. But what the Vedic tradition offers us is that there is karma and progression. So our starting point is determined by the place where we left in the previous life. It's like if a cricket match is going on, and say one team starts right in the beginning with a score of 200. Say why is this team starting with 200? One explanation could be that the scoreboard operates, operates chaotically. And it's by chance this team got a 200 score. But that's not the way you function. During the innings, only when a batsman scores, then the scoreboard grows. So at the start, it is starting, starting it's arbitrary. The second could be that oh, the scorekeeper is biased. The scorekeeper arbitrarily decides that this, this should be the starting score. The third and most reasonable explanation is that it is not the first innings. The team which seems to have a starting score of 200 has scored more in the previous life, previous innings. So basically, when we look at the world as it exists, the idea of a previous life and continuation from the previous life is the most reasonable explanation for it. Now, is this, does it involve faith? Of course. But does it, is it based only on faith? Certainly not. It is a logical, uh, the most logical explanation of what would otherwise be completely unexplainable. Okay? Uh, my question is, do, uh, actually we came from the uh, it is told that by the Stephen Hawking and others that we came from one infinite power in a very small center of uh, then we, we had been to the existence and we'll, it is a sort of expansion that is Big Bang Theory so if you, if you try to correlate in that way probably uh, the uh, philosophy of uh, evolution goes better than the physiology of belief. So you will have to rethink okay, on the basis because the scientists are not uh, in, a, in a point to admit the fact of the faith because they are the believer which is that, can, that can be experimented, okay. intervened and will come with an evidence to be repeated and reproduced. So we will yes. have to be scientific, number one. Yes, let me complete address this point. Thank you. See if there's good questions really. So, science has three different methods for determining its theories. One is deductive, the second is inductive, and the third is abductive. So, deductive means, for example, it's math. So, okay, 3 plus 9 is 12. It's based, it's deduced based on the very principles of mathematics. Now, very little in the physical world can be actually deduced because real life it's, its messy complexity is not just about numbers so most of science operates based on inductive logic or inductive reasoning where we do a certain number of experiments and based on that we infer this is the law operating over here so when Newton saw an apple falling he postulated the idea of gravity and based on that he did repeated experiments so others did repeated experiments there's a stone fall does this fall not just in London, but in Paris also, in other parts of the world. So, there's repeated experiments. And this is where science has had the most success. Even phenomenal success. 
the sound system the internet air transportation however when it comes to origins origin of the universe origin of life origin of species science cannot use the inductive method the origin of the universe is a one time event there is no possibility for doing repeated experiments to evaluate how things happen origin of species origin of life these are all one time event that have happened now we can speculate and guess about what kind of conditions were there and how those things may have happened at that time but we really don't know exactly what kind of conditions were there and we don't really know when those conditions interact at that scale what would happen so my point is abductive reasoning is highly tentative so what happens this is a this is a sometimes an honest mistake and sometimes a dishonest mistake uh, honest mistake is that the credit that is due to science because of its success through theories made using inductive reasoning that same credit is applied to theories deduced using abductive reasoning so big bang theory there is no experiment to replicate that from happening even origin of life or origin of species there is no experiment specifically to replicate that so theories made using abductive reasoning they are basically like a mystery novel somebody deducing how did this murder happen so you cannot tell the criminal please come and commit the murder again and we'll catch you in action so in so theories of science you know, which are which are developed during using abductive reasoning they need to be seen with due caution like say you are a, as you said you are a pediatrician now there are medicines which have been well tested and there are experimental medicines now sometimes if a child is really sick and there is no medicine available that you may recommend some experimental medicine or treatment but you have a moral duty and a professional duty to tell the patients or the patient's parents that this is experimental medicine it may work but it involves some unpredictable risks also and then the student patients should be given willing consent to that kind of experimental medicine so theories like big bang or evolution they need to come with that kind of disclaimer that the same credit credibility that comes to theory of gravity or to fluid mechanics and the laws of thermodynamics that cannot be applied to these theories so these are they fall in a different category and they need to be seen with due skepticism now having said that these are talking both whether whether these theories are true or false they are talking about how matter formed they are not talking about how consciousness emerged there is no satisfactory explanation the theory of evolution in terms of biological evolution may have some evidence but a theory of evolution in terms of chemical evolution how consciousness emerged from matter that is that has very very little evidence the science magazine in its 125th anniversary published a article about 125 questions that science doesn't have answers to the second question over there was what is the origin of consciousness the first question was what is the origin of the universe so what dawkins proposes a singularity from which something emerges that is his theory that is but if you consider the mainstream scientists the origin of the universe and origin of consciousness these are unexplored these are unanswered questions and there is a lot more to explore within that so the spiritual explanations or the explanation from the vedic traditions or other traditions these are also worth exploring rather than presuming that certain scientific theories are necessarily true when even mainstream science acknowledges that these are unanswered questions another query is that whether uh, my query, uh, that is query the is this soul uh, it is uh, said in gita it is not perceivable not expressible soul so which is not perceived which is not expressible how can you really 
have faith on it number 1 and i had last question to you okay, let me just complete this about and the see the in the gita is saying that it is not perceivable percept uh, yes uh, okay uh, is uh, yeah, sanskrit is like this abang manusho gochara that means it cannot be expressed it cannot be perceived according to gita okay so, now uh, now that particular point now that particular phrase doesn't come in the gita it might come in some other books the gita does talk about uh, certain aspects of the soul achintyoyam avikaryoyam it talks about like that now what it means is important like i said that there is something like science itself says that we go from visible phenomena to invisible principles so the gita also says that in the search for identity in the understanding of who we are we need to go beyond our visible roles so you are a doctor you are probably a father you know you are uh, maybe you are a son not maybe you are a son we all have different roles but is there a core to us beyond our roles that's the question that the gita is exploring and it says that this core itself cannot be perceived by externals now we all have our roles but no some people not like to be reduced to their roles yeah you know i'm a parent i am a i am a i am a bangladeshi citizen but there is so much more to me than just these roles so the vedanta gita says the soul is not perceivable what it means is through the externals we identify ourselves with certain roles but the core of us is beyond these roles now when it says it cannot be perceived it means that simply by our senses it cannot be perceived but with our intelligence gyan chakshu with the eyes of wisdom utkramantam sitam vapi punjanam gunanvitam vimudhan anupashyanti pashyanti gyan chakshushah with the eyes of wisdom we can perceive it so like that whether it is the principle now we can talk about gravity can be perceived but in science there is the idea of dark matter dark matter or in science there is the idea of parallel universes now parallel universes by their very definition they cannot be perceived but then there is some mathematical inference by which their existence has been postulated and those scientists who are postulating it are not just engaging in free imagination they do some reasoning so the gita is saying that it cannot be perceived in the sense that with our senses with what is visible we can't perceive it but with intelligence we can so doctor i was in canada i spoke at the toronto university so there is a, is a research center for doctor dedicated doctor builder penfield he is considered the father of modern neuroscience especially neurosurgery so he he wrote several books one of which is the mystery of the mind and there he gives an experiment which led him to conclude that consciousness does not have a material or a cerebral origin so what was the experiment he did that now now we know different parts of the brain are connected with different physical functions so there's a part of the brain see the parietal lobe or whatever is connected with the motor nervous system so he asked a subject to raise his hand and the subject raised his hand under neural imaging they saw that a particular part of the brain had got activated and he asked the subject to lower his hand and that part of the brain got deactivated now using electrodes he activated that part of the brain and then the subject's hand went up and then he asked the subject what happened he said my hand went up and he asked the subject more specifically did you raise your hand he said no i didn't raise my hand he says you raised my hand. then he deactivated that part of the probe that that probe and the hand fell down he says did you lower your what happened he says my hand fell down did you lower your hand he said no i didn't now dr penfield he repeated this experiment while simultaneously activating other parts of the brain he wanted to see whether there is any part of the brain when it is activated gives the patient gives the subject the sense of agency that i 
I am acting. So when different parts of the brain were activated, the subject remembered some childhood food they had eaten, maybe they had played some games, some conversation they had years ago. Many stimuli came up. But no part of the brain when activated gave a sense of agency to the subject. So the idea is, is to explain in analog terms, in a, uh, that is say if this is my computer and here there is a printer next to me. Now I can press the print button over here and then the printer's hand will start moving. Now you can come and you can press the print button and then the print hand will start moving. So in Penfield's experiment, in the second case, it was he, Dr. Penfield, who pressed the print button. Press the print button. The print button is like the center of the brain which is associated with the motor nervous system which causes the hand to go up and down. So now his question is, who pressed the print button in the first case? Who is it that is saying that I didn't press it in the second case? So no matter how much he probed the brain, he couldn't find that. So therefore he concluded that the source of consciousness is extracerebral. The mind is like a, the brain is like a computer, but it is programmed by something outside of itself. So there is, there are not scientific, I would say, proof, but there are scientific pointers toward the idea of consciousness coming from something beyond matter. Okay. Last question is that, do you suggest a society of law or a society of spirituality to be interrelated, to be present for a very conducive society? I feel uh, it is law not... Law or law? L-A-W? Law, L-A-W. L-A-W, yes. Okay, good point. See, actually, spirituality recognizes that law is essential. See, one of the things about spirituality is that it says we humans have a higher nature and we have a lower nature. So, the higher nature is what needs to be developed. This needs to be developed. But at the same time, the lower nature needs to be disciplined. And traditionally, there are two aspects of society, social management. So the higher nature is developed through Shastra. And the, lo so, and the lower nature is disciplined through Shastra. Shastra is wisdom. Shastra is weapons. So now, there will be a small and significant minority who, in whom the higher nature is more prominent. And for them, Shastra, wisdom is vital. And they will themselves realize how acting according to morality, acting according to spirituality is in their best interests. But there are many in whom the lower nature is prominent. And for them, Shastra in terms of wisdom alone will not work. And that's why Shastra is required. So when, when the Bhagavad Gita described that the avatar descends to this world, the avatar uses Shastra. The avatar also gives wisdom, Shastra. So wisdom and weapons, both are required, Shastra and Shastra. So spirituality is not just about spiritual, it is also about recognizing the reality of the material. And that means people with lower nature will need law to regulate themselves. However, if society is governed only by laws, then people will keep finding loopholes to get out of the laws. So laws need a purpose, a vision. And that vision is not just order in this world. There is also some higher purpose beyond this world. So Shastra and Shastra both go together. Okay. Thank you. Very good questions. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, dear audience, I have an announcement. Yeah. Okay. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, we have scanty of time. So I, we think we will not be able to uh, take all the questions. Uh, I have an announcement for all of you. Uh, we have three books available, written by our Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, translated into Bengali, uh, available uh, in, at the front desk. 
আত্মিক সংকটে কিভাবে সুখে থাকা যায় আমাদের মন্দির প্রয়োজন কেন ওয়াই ডু উই নিড এ টেম্পল অ্যান্ড এনার্জি শক্তি দিস থ্রি বুকস আর অ্যাভেলেবেল অ্যাট দ্য ফ্রন্ট ডেস্ক ইফ ইউ নিড ইউ ক্যান কালেক্ট দোস অ্যান্ড উই উইল মুভ টু আর নেক্সট কোয়েশ্চেন্স উইল বিন উই উইল নট বি টেকিং মাস কোয়েশ্চেন্স দেওয়ার ওয়াজ এ কোয়েশ্চেন উই উইল টেক দ্য কোয়েশ্চেন বাট দেয়ার ইজ এ অলসো আ কোয়েশ্চেন আই আই রিকোয়েস্ট অল অফ ইউ টু হ্যাভ পেশেন্স প্লিজ লাইক প্রভু ইউ গট এ কোয়েশ্চেন লাইক ডু উই রিয়েলি নিড আ গুরু অর অর্গানাইজেশন টু প্র্যাকটিস স্পিরিচুয়ালিটি ওকে so do we need a guru organization see guru is a person who is essentially has gone on the spiritual path in every field if you are serious if somebody is in athletics they want a coach who will help them grow on that path so same principle applies in the spiritual domain now as far as the organization is concerned essentially what is an organization it is made of individuals so the example is given that each one of us we are like a trickle of water and say if there is a large mountain and then there is a ocean over here so now from the mountain the water is coming down now there could be many obstacles on the way so now now each small trickle of water maybe it can come all the way down to the ocean but if many trickles of water come together to form a tributary the tributaries come together to form a river then the river has a far greater chance of getting to the ocean the river will eventually form a bed by the flow of the river itself will form a bed and that will make it easier for the water to go towards the ocean so each individual who wants to practice spirituality is like that trickle of water and they want to get to the ocean that is the ultimate spiritual destination so now when spiritually minded people come together at that time they form an organization just they coming together is an organization but unfortunately whenever there is an organization like whenever there is a whenever there is water flowing smoothly in large quantity there will be people who will come and form a dam now they are not interested in going to the river they are interested in tapping the water for their own purposes so like that when a community of spiritually minded people come together and they create some infrastructure they create some resources so that everybody can go on the spiritual journey smoothly there are people with vested interests who come they are not interested in spirituality and they want to use those facilities for their own purposes such people give spiritual organization a bad name so on one side organizations on a negative side uh, they can have rigid hierarchy which can interrupt the spiritual growth of individuals it can have selfish self interested people who can exploit but on a positive side organization can also provide rich facilities for spiritual growth so anybody can pray to god but if there is a temple then there is a whole atmosphere which directs our consciousness higher and now if there is a there is a substantially big temple there has to be some organization to maintain that temple so in this world organization is a necessary evil and when we join an organization if at all if we decide to join an organization it's important that we remember the purpose why we are there so we are like joining the river so that we can get to the ocean we are not joining the river so that we can build a dam and we can block that water from going ahead so if we keep our purpose clear then the organization can become a very rich resource it can provide us many resources for our spiritual growth dear audience as we have scanty of time we will be taking last two questions one questions raised from the uh, from this side and uh, another from this side we will be taking last two questions three questions but, uh, will we be able to uh, take all the all the all the three questions as our guests are very busy and we also need to uh, think of their time uh, like uh, let's start with that that question please okay 
Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, to me, the whole world is uh, nothing but a summation of millions of uh, chemical reactions and millions of rules of physics. Uh, uh, some of them are known to us and most of them are un unknown to us. The very few who are known to us, we are calling them as we are practicing science. We are the so-called science that we are calling that. We are um, know something about the science. Actually, these are very few uh, millions of uh, chemical reactions and millions of rules of physics that is happening in the whole universe. And uh, the question is that uh, that we are calling science, and we are knowing that in a particular way of learning, and that is uh, the. Uh, way of learning through the some Western methods of learning. Uh, we are going to some schools and some universities, some colleges. Now my, now my question is that uh, so far I know uh, uh, you are an engineer. Okay, you have uh, directed yourself from engineering to the way of spirituality. Uh, I am also in a profession, but I am uh, I am not telling that I am not uh, away from spirituality, but I am practicing spirituality in my own way. But you are far ahead from from me. So my question is, if I also convert myself uh, from my profession to the way of spirituality like you, so millions of that chemical reactions happening in the universe or in the uh, millions of rules of physics that's happening in the universe, how I can align my spirituality like you uh, to the knowing of that chemical reactions or that uh, rules of physics, how can I know that? Uh, that you have uh, set some examples of uh, science and then my teacher, uh, Professor uh, Julon Sharma, also have uh, set some examples of science like examples of Newton that apple is falling from the uh, yes. tree or uh, rules of uh, uh, Stephen Hawking. Yes. So uh, how can spirituality can help or, or by the way of spirituality, how can you know that uh, particular way of science? Okay, it is my good question. question. Thank you. So essentially, there is a notion of spirituality where we turn away from the world and we neglect or reject the world. Well, that is not, the, as like I talk about spirituality, we have been given some gifts and we are meant to use those gifts. So, for me, as I said, even before I was introduced to spirituality, I was interested in the power of education. And in one sense, now I am sharing, I am doing what I was meant to do. I am sharing spiritual education. The content of what I am sharing is uh, is has evolved with time, but essentially I'm doing what I'm meant to do. So each one of us, wherever we are, we can find out what gifts we have, what, what nature we have in terms of uh, what are our natural inclinations, and we try to dovetail them. And in fact, if you consider a spiritual view is actually the most conducive for scientific research. And a non-spiritual or atheistic view is actually the least conducive for scientific research. Why is that? Because, like you said, the universe is rich with so many laws that are unexplored. So now, if we came across, if say, if we are in archaeology, and we came across some patterns on some wall that was dug under, it was discovered after digging. Now, if we presume, oh, these are just random marks that have come from nature, then we wouldn't explore them any further. Hmm? But if we knew that these are indications, these marks are scripts of some ancient language, then we would focus with more energy. Okay, what does this mean? What does this scribbling mean? What does this particular symbol mean? So basically the idea that the universe is pregnant with meaning is most compatible with the idea that the universe has some organizing principle within it. So if the universe is just a random product in, in its entirety, is there randomness in the universe? Of course. But if the universe is a completely a random product, then even the very existence of laws itself is a question. Because in the rigidly materialistic worldview, where do the laws that science is discovering come from? That is itself an unanswered question. It's taken like an article of faith that the universe operates based on laws. But what is the origin of these laws? 
So that is uh, open to question. So, so my, the point I'm making is, if we have a spiritual worldview, then we understand that the universe has an organizing principle behind it, and we can explore that organizing the the way the universe has been organized with greater confidence and greater energy. Newton famously said that, "Oh Father, I." Think thy thoughts after thee. What he meant by that is, he saw his scientific discoveries as spiritual insights into how God has fashioned the universe. So in that sense, a spiritual worldview can actually help us to do scientific research. We see that the, it is the higher reality, it is the divine who has filled meaning in the universe and it's that divine who has given us intelligence by which we can discover that meaning. Okay? Dear audience, uh, we need to conclude the question and session. We are extremely sorry for that. Um, we have a request. Uh, you, you are given with a uh, feedback form. Please complete the feedback form, please. Uh, some of us already left the uh, hole without submitting the feedback form. You are requested to do, do so. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are thrilled to listen to Chaitanya Charan Prabhu for his uh, valuable insights about science and spirituality. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. May I take the pleasure of calling here Dr. Ramandu Pariyal, Associate Professor's Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, University of Chittagong, to share his realization, short realization with us. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me here to share my uh, something about today's seminar. <clears throat> I'm uh, really impressed to uh, get the chance to participate in this seminar and listening uh, to the to our uh, Prabhu and getting some important information, direction of life <laughs> to how to lead the life to spirituality. The SIF theory, I think it's, it's a marvelous theory to lead our life and connect our life to, um, with God who has created us. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Now, I would like to request Dr. Bidhan Roy, Professor, Department of Pediatrics, USTC, to share his realization. Hare Krishna. Prokita Pokhe Ami Kubi Obibuto, Ebong Ami Kub satisfied Ami Jodio spiritual life near to Chorcha Korchi into Erkum Seminary actually Ami a prothom as Mani Achi Jodio. বিভিন্ন ধর্মীয় সেমিনার হয় কিন্তু এইভাবে বিজ্ঞান ভিত্তিক আলোচনা আমি এখানে আসলে প্রথম এসেছি তো এখানে অনেক জ্ঞানী গুণী ব্যক্তি আছেন যার মধ্যে প্রফেসর ঝুলনদাস শর্মার কথা আমি উল্লেখ করতে চাই যিনি আমার সম্পর্কে মামা আবি আবার আমি যখন ডিসিএস করি তিনি আমার টিচারও ছিলেন ডাইরেক্ট টিচার ছিলেন আমার পরীক্ষা নিয়েছেন পাশাপাশি অনেক ডাক্তার ইঞ্জিনিয়ার এখানে আছেন তো প্রকৃতপক্ষে যেখানে যা আমি বুঝতে পেরেছি Uh, SIP জিনিসটা আমরা আশা করি আমি আর বলার দরকার মনে করছি না 
তবে এই আধ্যাত্মিকতা যদি চর্চা করতে হয় তাহলে অবশ্যই ভগবদ্গীতার একটা শ্লোক আমি বলতে চাই যেটা বিজ্ঞান যোগের প্রথম শ্লোক ভগবান কি বলছেন মজ্জাশক্ত মনা পার্থ যোগন জুঞ্জন মদাশ্রয় অর্থাৎ পরমেশ্বর ভগবান যে আছেন তাকে বিশ্বাস করে তার আশ্রয় গ্রহণ করে তার শরণাগত হয়ে এই বিজ্ঞান যোগটা আমাদেরকে বুঝতে হবে এই বিশ্বাসটুকু আপনি সায়েন্স বুঝতে হলেও প্রভু বলছেন হ্যাঁ সেখানে আপনাকে বিশ্বাস লাগবে ঠিক আধ্যাত্মিকতা বুঝতে হলেও আপনার আশ্রয় গ্রহণ করতে হবে পরম সেই পরম তত্ত্বের আশ্রয় গ্রহণ করতে হবে আপনার এখানে যারা আসছেন সবাই অবশ্যই আমি মনে করি যে আপনারা পরমেশ্বর ভগবানে বিশ্বাস করেন তবে সেটা হতে পারে নিরাকার সেরা হতে পারে সাকার যাই হোক না কেন ভাগবত এই সম্পর্কে বলা হয়েছে বদন্তিত তত্ত্ববিদ তত্ত্বম যজ্ঞান অধ্যয়ম ব্রহ্মেতি পরমাত্মেতি ভগবত ভগবানেতি শব্দতে অর্থাৎ সেই পরম তত্ত্ব নিরাকার যদি বলেন তাও ঠিক আপনি যদি পরমাত্মাকে ভগবান মানেন তাও ঠিক এবং পরমেশ্বর ভগবানকেও যদি ভগবান মানেন তাও ঠিক সেই পরম তত্ত্ব অথবা সেই পরম সত্য অথবা সেই পরমেশ্বর ভগবানের আশ্রয় নিয়ে যদি আপনি বিজ্ঞান চর্চা করেন তাহলে অবশ্যই ধীরে ধীরে আপনি নিঃসংশয় হতে পারবেন আপনার সংশয় অবশ্যই থাকবে ধীরে ধীরে সেটা চলে যাবে এবং তখনই প্রভু যেটা বললেন পিউরিটি সেই শুদ্ধতা আমরা লাভ করতে পারব এবং তার মাধ্যমেই এই মানব জীবনের উদ্দেশ্যটা আমরা সফল করতে পারব আপনি যতই শাস্ত্র অধ্যয়ন করবেন উপনিষদ অধ্যয়ন করবেন বেদ অধ্যয়ন করবেন দেখবেন একটা কথা কিন্তু আছে এই মানুষ জীবন মনুষ্য জন্ম খুবই দুর্লভ কিন্তু এটা ক্ষণস্থায়ী এই মনুষ্য জীবনের পরে যেটা এখন ভিডিওতে দেখলাম আমরা কোন জন্ম পাব তার কোনো নিশ্চয়তা নেই অতএব এই মানব জীবনটা যদি আমরা সফল করতে চাই এখনই সময় পরমেশ্বর ভগবানের উপর বিশ্বাস রেখে এইভাবে আপনি বিশ্লেষণের মাধ্যমেও আপনার জীবনটা সফল করতে পারেন পরিবেশে আমি আবার সবাইকেও কৃতজ্ঞতা জানাচ্ছি আয়োজকদের পক্ষ থেকে এবং আমি অনুরোধ করব যেন প্রভু চৈতন্যচরণ প্রভু ওনাকে আমি দণ্ডবোধ প্রণতি নিবেদন করছি অ্যান্ড আই রিকোয়েস্টিং ইউ প্লিজ মেক সাম প্রোগ্রাম ইচ অ্যান্ড এভরি ইয়ার টু কাম হেয়ার অ্যান্ড টু এনলাইটেড আস বাই দিস ফ্রান অনেক ধন্যবাদ থ্যাংক ইউ ভেরি মাচ